Welcome to Dad Space. Space for Dads. Today I have Stephen Garrett on with me. Reverend is on with me. We're going to go to church today and we're going to support dads in our conversation. We're going to introduce you to somebody called Father John. We do meet Father John. Some great resources, some great inspiration today for you, Dad. And the power went out halfway through the interview. Ha <laughs> ha! So we recovered. All for you here on Dad Space. Hope you enjoy. Yep, so the power went out halfway through our interview with Stephen. So we had to uh, come up with a plan B midstream, and we survived. We always survive. It's all for you here on Desmond. So Stephen's here. We're going to talk about um, a great story he shared with me about Father John and about leaving a legacy for your kids. We're going to talk about his podcast. We're going to talk about him, Stephen, as a barber. He's put down his scissors and he's gone out to help people uh, do life and do life better. He talks about his family and his relationship with his wife. And we even talk at the end a little bit in regards to our listeners who are single parents, single dad, single mom, doing everything. So a little bit for you at the end of the podcast as well. So thank you for being here. Here we go. Here's my conversation. And if you notice a break in the sound about halfway through, that's when all the lights went out, like completely. <laughs> I love podcasting. Here we go. It's a Dad Space podcast. Stephen Garrett's in with me today. Here we go. Okay, everyone. Welcome to Dad Space a podcast for dads by dads. And today we're going to take you to church because we have a great guest with us today. And um, we're going to talk about being a dad. We're going to talk about some a great story that we're going to talk about, about someone named Father John, which is going to come up later. Uh, a story that changed the way I view so much in my life. And I, I, I appreciate that we've had a chance to talk about that in the past. But uh, Reverend Stephen is here with us today. We're going to talk about all things dad, and I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome to the podcast. Great to have you here. Pleasure to be here. Pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to be here today. And so you are originally from Alabama, correct? No, I'm originally from Detroit. I that's live right. in Alabama. Oh, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And you're visiting yeah. in Detroit right now. Visiting in Detroit, had the pleasure of installing my brother-in-law as the new president of the West Side Ministers Alliance here in town. And so just here to stay aside, stay along a little bit, to see some families, visit with my mother, and uh, just enjoy being home a little bit. Get a chance to eat some of uh, the food that I can only get in Detroit. There you go. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So uh, that's amazing. And it's so glad to have you on the podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Because Glad to be here. Talking, about, talking to you in the past, uh, I just... I walked away from that encounter inspired uh, and excited about our conversation today. So can you give us a little background on you as well? Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I can. So uh, clearly my name is Stephen Garrett. Uh, I am a pastor for more than 15 years. Uh, I've had the privilege of pastoring two wonderful churches within that time. I've created a podcast for uh, not only pastors, but leaders in general, Pulpit View podcast, which is just a joy of mine to help leaders uh, tell their side of the story. And then I have uh, probably the greatest, uh, greatest accomplishment next to Jesus is that me and my wife has been married for now 16 years. We have uh, five beautiful children, four boys, one, one precious daughter, and uh, I have a passion for leading in not only leadership spaces, but also just being able to help men tell their side of the story. Uh, there's a lot of struggle in balancing our lives because for most of us as brothers, we deal with uh, we deal with the struggle of the responsibility to not just raise families, uh, be fi being the financial support. But we also have the responsibility of not being able to be as emotionally supported sometimes as I think we need. I know growing up in Detroit, Michigan, 
where uh, I was blessed to have a phenomenal mother and father, um, a dad that uh, grew up in the harder times of society and did not get the privilege of having a father in the way that uh, many men need a dad. He had to kind of learn from the ropes. So he made many mistakes, but I always treasure knowing his story that he did it better than it was given to him. And so uh, I had to define what fatherhood looked for, looked towards me. Uh, my dad was a hardworking man, but spent very little time with his children, even though he was in the house in relations to fun. Uh, when we spent time with my dad, it was usually working in the yard, doing some type of work. Um, and we would learn our life lessons from that. But uh, as I grew up, I also recognized that my kids had to see multiple sides of me. And so I wanted them to see the sides I did not see of my father that I would hear about from other people. And so that developed my passion as a father. It developed my passion as a husband. I, I I would love to say that my dad uh, did everything right, but I have some siblings outside. Uh, and so uh, I wanted to make sure my kids had a stronger foundation in that than I did. And so I'm grateful now that as I've gotten a little older, my oldest son, 14, probably gave me the biggest testimony that I could ever have received from a father last week uh, as we were talking about boys and girls and uh, how he's starting to like some young ladies. Uh, he expressed to me, daddy, I would love to have a relationship with like you and mommy, but I'm not sure if I can find what you all have out there now. And I just want to know what is it, what is it going to take? This is a 14-year-old bo young boy, but he's wide beyond his years. Uh, what is it going to take to be a man like you? And to have your son uh, tell you that he aspires to be someone like you uh, may be the best compliment I'll ever receive. I don't think there's anything that can match to that compliment. Maybe my daughter telling me one day she wants to marry a man like me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> can't match it, but... Uh, that, that is my life story. So I've now had the privilege of pastoring uh, and leading. I used to own a barbershop. Last year, I stepped away from my barbershop to go into full-time ministry and public speaking and to run the podcast. Uh, and God has been good to me during this time. So uh, that is my life really in a nutshell. I have uh, philanthropists, love doing in the community, love giving back. Uh, I love to see men really establish their role in manhood, understanding who they are, their responsibility in their family, uh, and then understanding that they can own that responsibility. They don't have to give it up to anybody else. And so that's my that's my life story, really, in a nutshell. I love it. Can we go to the barbershop for a moment? Can yes, sir. Tell me about some of the community that was created in that barbershop. Some of the discussions that were happening well, while guys were gathered there to come and see you and your team there, what kind of community and family to keep kind of sprouted from there? So I'll say I can speak directly to the Black Barbershop experience because for us, that is really, that's a nexus of its own. Uh, it is uh, where you find most people develop their religious belief in the barbershop. They develop their uh, mental structure in the barbershop. That's where most men go for their therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. I used to love um, some of the old gangster movies that you see and the guy would be in the barbershop and all the work, all of the business was taken care of in the barbershop. Well, that's the black barbershop aesthetic. You would have men that that's their place of safety. For years, uh, I remember growing up, you, uh, my dad had a unisex salon. And so he had men and women in there, uh, but he still had a barbershop. He owned multiple ones. Well, one barbershop 
you would rarely see women in that barbershop. And it was almost an unwritten rule that it was a safe zone for <laughs> men to be men in. Okay. Uh, we could have the conversations that we did. We just wanted to get it off our chest without feeling like uh, we were being judged by others. And so in the barbershop that I that I say pastored, yeah. but that I had the opportunity of owning, I would deal with men that came from every single different background. I'm talking about, I had lawyers, I had doctors, I had professors that would come into my barbershop. I even had some of the, th the, the biggest thugs in the city come into my barbershop. The one thing I found out is that when you close the door, all of their lives seem to be similar. Some of them were dealing with the exact, exact same problem. Uh, many men felt like uh, manhood was not an option but it was a responsibility that they did not get to choose how they were going to be a man. It was just, this is what's thrust on me. Other men would tell me many a times that uh, their biggest issue was manhood wasn't defined by men, but it was defined by the women that they, uh, they were in relationships with. If you were a good man, it was based upon what your spouse or your significant other said. It wasn't based upon another, uh, your father's point of view or your uncle's point of view. It is based upon how that woman that you love viewed it and the responsibilities that came with it was also based upon it. One of the conversations we had, and I, I, I will always remember this vividly, it was a young lady in the shop and she was talking about uh, how uh, men sometimes abuse their position. And so one young man posed a question. He said, as a father, he said, uh, do you think I have the right to make the final say in the household? And she said, no, because we have all of these aspects. She said, as a mother, do you think you have the right to, to make the final say in a child. Yes, that's my child. And he said, he said, that is the conflict right there. He said, that's your child, but the family is my responsibility. Mm. And I thought that was such a profound statement because I, I recently had an issue where a young man came, brought his son in to get his hair cut and the mom came in and acted a mess when she found out her son was getting a haircut. This is his father, not a stepdad, not not a man that she knew that was taking on some responsibility. This is a present father who wanted to get his hair cut. And she came in and she continued to go off on him. And she tried to go off on me, but she 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 met her match. She said <laughs> she came to me and said, uh, if this was your child with your wife, I said, I'm not a good example. I said, because my wife has no say when it comes to our boys and their haircuts. I said, as I do not confer with her on how our daughter is to wear her hair. I said, she's, I will never know what it's like to be a woman. Hmm. I said, but I do know what it's like to be a man. I, so my responsibility is to raise men that other women will want to marry someday. I said, so the only way she's going to be able to do, only way they're going to be able to do that if I get the freedom to do that. Mm -hmm. And so that was really the end of the conversation. But that always stuck with me that she said, that's my child, but the family is your responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a disconnection there for sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There's not an equal approach, a partnership. Yeah. In yeah. that situation. I Yeah, I totally agree with you. What do you see now outside of the barbershop, couples coming to you to talk to you about their relationship, about their home, their family? Are you seeing some things that seem to be coming up more often where you're having the same conversation with multiple couples? And kind of can we kind of talk about that as far as how do we take that conversation and and help the person listening today and maybe they're in the same in the same boat how do what kind of things are you seeing right now as you as you work with couples 
Uh, so there's a book by the name of uh, Love and Respect. I forget the author, but um, in the book, it's a it's a red and white book. Uh, it says men desire men desire respect, women desire love, and so they're basically saying the way a man uh, views love is through respect, and the way a woman views respect is through love, and so one of the I want to say the the I don't want to say consensus, but one of the unique things that I consistently see in marriage counseling, talking to couples uh, with me and my wife is a breakdown of understanding that I can't love you the way I want to be loved. I have to love you the way you want to be loved. Mm. And so we always talk about to, to our young ladies and our young men that come in is if I'm allergic to shrimp and my wife says, I want to do something nice for my husband tonight. I just want to cook him a romantic meal. Now, my wife loves shrimp, but I'm allergic to shrimp. And she decides that she's going to make me a shrimp dinner, a shrimp feast. Is that truly love? Mm. And so she she uses that example, and I think it's phenomenal because it crosses the boundary of gender lines, right? Yeah. If If the game is, if I just want to watch the game, and my wife, she loves the ballet. If I want to show her how much I love her, I decide to take her to a Lions game. Uh, that may not portray to her love. And I think one of the biggest disconnects we have is that I can't love you the way I want to be loved. I must love you the way you need to be loved. Mm. And so we, we, we're we trying to repair that ability com to communicate. Because one of the struggles we have, Dave, I think that our culture has more than anything, is we see social media's presence of how things are going to go. And then we base our lifestyles off of that ourselves. So we say, okay, they're, they got all this lovey-dovey. They're always on here. But if your husband is not a person who shows public displays of affection, that might not mean he doesn't love you. That just means he doesn't like showing public displays of affection. And he didn't like showing public displays of affection before Instagram showed up on the scene. So it's not going to change. No. <laughs> it's not going to change anything once Instagram shows up. And so we have to understand each person has a love language. Yeah. Each person has a way of communicating their responsibilities. I remember for years, for myself, me making sure bills were paid was, was major in my mind. My wife, that was not as major because she just knew I was going to take care of it. But for me, I felt like there was a lack of love if, bill, if bills were late. I felt. And so I had to start helping some brothers to understand that even some of your hangups that were caused from your personal trauma mm. may not be their way. You think you're showing them love because, hey, bills are getting paid, food is on the table. She's like, all I want you to do is come home on time. I don't care if we have the nicest car. We can have a car that can get us up down the road. I just want to have, I want to see you. Mm. And so I start helping brothers to understand in their relationships even the ways that we feel that we're showing love and affection may not be the way that they need to receive love and affection. And the best way to find out the kind of love and respect that our partner or our spouse wants is to talk to them. Yeah. And ask. Yeah. Because again, don't assume that paying the bills, taking out the garbage is demonstrating love. You know, you one of the hardest thing, though, I think is that part of asking yeah. I think it's a fear. Mm. Uh, something we did early in our relationship, and the Lord gave me this. I, I got to give it to the Lord because I'm not wise enough to do it, right? <laughs> um, we, When we would take long trips to see the other side of the family, um, we used to go to Detroit in one holiday and in D.C. in another holiday where my wife is from. And so we cut the radio off as we were driving, and I just asked, what can I do better? 
me starting that conversation opened her up to ask the same question. Mm. What can I do better? Now, the first time I asked that, baby, you do everything great. I was like, now, listen, you ain't got a lot. We got a, there's a movie called Friday. Uh, <laughs> and so there's a point in the movie that says, you ain't got a lot, Craig. You ain't got a lot. <laughs> I tell, I say, you ain't got a lot, Craig. You ain't got a lot. What, what can I do better? How can I show up better? She would tell me and I wouldn't re overreact when she told me. I think sometimes we're afraid to ask people, our spouses especially, what I may not be doing as adequately because we don't want to hear the response. Mm -hmm. And we, I think we somewhat expect them to come in a violent way. And I don't mean violent in attacking, but yeah. violent in not protecting our feelings that we are so drawn that we just want to keep doing it until we figure it out ourselves. And that's men or women. I think we have to be open to be vulnerable yes. in, in conversing with one another. And so when we started doing that, she would come back and say, okay, since you asked me, what can I do better? And she was open to hearing the areas that I needed to be loved because I was willing to allow her to tell me areas that she needed to be loved. And then following up with actual follow through. And I think that's hard for some people, that follow through part. And it opens the door to future conversations and more feedback, more discussion. And I love how you, you were vulnerable to start. And you created that safe space to have that conversation because there's things that probably as partners and spouses that we think about that we'd love to talk about, but we never find the right time. So you created yeah. the time and space to do that. It's great. It's a great, a great idea for, for the dads listening to this podcast. Yeah. I love it. The one thing too, I wanted to talk about was the idea of a legacy as a dad, as a father, yeah. as leaving a yeah. legacy for our family. And how do we do that? And you gave me an amazing story about Father John, was it? Yeah, and Father, it, John. You, Father John. You, you, you just, I haven't forgotten it. And it's such a great impression on me. And I, I would love for you to kind of give us a synopsis of the story. And then let's tie that into the legacy that we leave for our kids. Because I, I think it's just an amazing, it. amazing story. So yeah, let's hear this. So Father John really is uh, out of a book called Outlive Your Life by Max Lucado. He tells a story of uh, not letting your life be uh, be contained to this moment of your breath, right? Of your day to day example that you can actually live in such a way that your life, even when you're gone from this side of glory, Mm. that your life can can live on. And so he tells a story of this uh, tribe, this, this captain of a ship, he lands on this island and there's two islands. One island is, uh, both are inhabited, but one island has almost nobody on the island except for this one tribe. And they're scarcely making it through. Then they, he travels to this other island and this other island, it has agriculture. It has uh, an irrigation system. It has everything to, to allow a small community to thrive. And he gets there and he asks one of the tribesmen, how is this possible? And so uh, they interpret. He tells them, listen, it is because of Father John. Father John taught us all of this. And so he says, well, let me talk to your chief. Chief comes and he says, I have to meet Father John. Uh, this is remarkable. Y'all are not connected to any mainlands and you have everything you need here. And he says, Father John has shown us everything that we need to do to survive. And so he said, well, show me Father John. I got, I got to meet Father John. He takes them to the fishing area where they have this uh, intricate fishing system set up. And he says, this is wonderful. And he says, this is uh, what Father John has taught us. And he says, well, where's Father John? 
uh, the chief looks a little bit uh, puzzled. And he says, I got to see Father John. Please take me to Father John. He takes them to their agriculture system, sees the irrigation that they have set up where the water is one, running, fresh water is feeding into the plants that they have, and it is lush and vibrant. And he sees it again. He said, this is phenomenal. But where is Father God, John? The tribesmen look at each other and looks at the chief. The chief says, the chief looks at him again and he says, please, I just have to talk to him to see how he was able to do all of this. And so he says, take me to Father John. They take him to the chapel and the, the captain, he just knew Father John was going to be at the chapel. And he goes and says, the chief says, Father John has brought us Jesus. He's given us uh, ways to worship. He's taught us hymns. And the chief, the captain gets a little bit frustrated, but not upset. And he says, that is phenomenal. But where is Father John? I want to talk to Father John. So they take him out to the graveside. He sees there lies Father John. Here lies Father John. And the captain, even more bewildered, poses a question. Father John has been dead all of this time. Why did you take me to all of these places? And the chief says something that has changed my life forever. And mm. that is, you asked to see Father John. Father John was in the way we fish. Father John was in the irrigation system. Father John was in our worship. Father John is in everything he showed us. And so that changed my life because as I'm a father, I realized that at some point my life is going to end. But what lives on is the legacy that we build. What we have shown our children, what we have laid as a foundation for our family. Uh, right now, and what I mentioned earlier about my son, my son has a desire to be a husband. He's a 14-year-old handsome kid that is thinking about marriage. Like, talk. my kids have conversations about the type of wives they want, how they want to raise their children. That is a legacy that I'm building. In a world where they're telling you, you don't need marriage, I have children that are talking about marriage. My kids, I'll tell you this, they one of the greatest things that happened uh, as as a young parent. I used to I used to have this book bag that I carried all of my tools in when I go to the shop. I would every day when I came in the house, I'd sit the book bag down that I had my tools in. I'd take my shoes off. I'd sit down on the couch, eat food with my family, and in the morning time, I'd pick that book bag out up and I'd head out the door. One day. My five-year-old son goes and gets his book bag that he's been taking to uh, taking to uh, Head Start, and he's he his mom says it's a Saturday. His mom asks him, "Where are you going?" "I'm going to work." She said, "Where where you work? Wherever Daddy works." In his mind, he has pictured that his father connects that book bag with work and supplying for his family. And I think many of us, we, we miss the part of what we're leaving and only what we're doing. We see all the stuff we're doing, but we don't understand the impact. My, my son, when he asked that question about, I don't think I can find a wife like mama and I want to be a husband, I want to be a husband like you, had to have a conversation with him. Because he sees me and my wife as never have argued a day in our life. And we don't argue a lot. But I told him, I said, the reason mama looks so perfect to you and the reason daddy looks so awesome to you is because there's an old saying, love covers a multitude of sin. He said, you will never see mommy in a bad light because that's not what you need to see. You'll not see daddy in a bad light because mama covers daddy in a bad light. And I think sometimes we're so we're so willing to allow our children to see the world in this totality that we don't protect the views that our children should have of who they are. I tell moms all the time, 
the last thing you want to ever paint to your son or your daughter is your husband or the father of your children in a bad light. One woman asked me why. I said, it's very simple. I said, let them find out for themselves. I said, but you painted a picture that you are to protect your spouse. So when they find out for themselves that their dad may not be the best person or their mom might not be the best person, what you've done is you've given them the option to determine what good is and what bad is versus you planting that in them because here's what they correlate. And there's something that I hated seeing in the barbershop that I would address on multiple occasions. When I would hear a mother say, you're just like your good for nothing father. Because what that does is pain in that child that this is my full level of potential, whether that be a boy or a girl. So I tell them, you have to make sure you're giving them a legacy that they can build. My kids know there's a responsibility on all of them. I tell every single one of my ch children, I say, you have a pretty smart daddy and you have a phenomenally intelligent mother there's not a dumb child we have because my kids they'll that one of my children when he got into math he was like daddy i just can't get it i said now nah, you done messed up he said what i said you said you can't i said that's the worst thing you could have told your daddy i said because your daddy's smart and your mama's a genius and my mom my wife will say the vice versa she'll say your mama's smart your daddy's a genius so what we've done is cut out the lie that you can't do anything. And so I tell them, you do have a responsibility to do great things. And I always tell my children, you could be a clown if you wanted to, but boy, you better run the circus. <laughs> you, 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 Daddy's going to support you in whatever you do, but you cannot be mediocre because mediocre does not live inside of you. And so I think we have a responsibility. Now, building a legacy comes in a bunch of different ways. I think building a legacy is making sure financially your family is stable. And that doesn't mean the job that you work, but that might mean that your children have life insurance and your wife has life insurance. My family understands the principle of investing in life insurance at an early age. All of my kids, they hear, they'll hear me tell them, one of the greatest thing I did for your mama is make sure if anything ever happens to me, she's rich. <laughs> I tell her, I, tell, I said, listen, I said, she might not be rich right now, but she'll be rich someday. I said, whether that's with me here or with me gone, I said, you all will be able to finish school or live your dreams. So part of my legacy building for my family is helping them to understand that what I do here, I want you to show and to live on through you. So I teach them financial education now because I'm like, I can't say that I'm going to be here tomorrow. Back in 2016, Dave, I got hit by a car walking across the street. I upped everything. I said, listen, you will not be in a place where all you're able to do is pay off. You're going to be in a place where if something happens to me because I saw in that moment that I would be here for as long as I wanted to be here. So legacy was me pouring everything I had in. There's an old saying, live today like there's no tomorrow. And so I pour everything in my family as if there's no tomorrow. One of the reasons me and my wife don't get into fights like that. And it's not because I'm always right or she's always right or because we're in always in agreement. One day she left the house. She was pregnant with our twins. She left the house. And we were mad about something. I don't even remember what it was mad about, but we were mad about it. But we always had a rule to say, I, I love you when they left, right? Uh, whether it was me or her. She was on her way and her, her car turned because it flooded. The, the area had a flash flood and it went into the embankment. When the ambulance got there, because the ambulance was immediately called when they found out she was pregnant, uh, she was 100% okay. They said if she had turned the wheel just the other way, this tree would have went straight through into the car. In my mind, I said, what if I said something did not mean and I had lost my wife? It wasn't worth it. It just wasn't worth it. So I, I live every single day as if there's a chance I won't be able to say it tomorrow.
So that's part of that legacy building, making sure that my family understands the value of today and not, not thinking I have tomorrow to make it right. So your legacy is not always about what happens when you're gone. It's also a living legacy that's happening in front of your children right now. Yes, yes, yes. Because right now is what you, we don't see it. But Father John, what Father John did that was so amazing was thing he did and taught them lived on after he was gone. We look at what, what legacy as only what we have left them to use after we're gone. But they were utilizing everything Father John had while he was there. But it made such an impact that it lived on after he was gone. I tell people, even when it comes to ministry, if ministry is only good while I'm here, then it really wasn't ministry. What I poured into my kids were only good while I was here, then it really wasn't legacy. And here's the next thing. If it wasn't good after I was gone, then it wasn't legacy. It has to play both roles. I'm working on financial independence now for my family because I, I want to enjoy certain things with my wife. I don't want her just to be able to say, hey, he left me well off when he was gone. I want her to say, hey, I enjoyed some of my life while he was here. <laughs> I don't want her being the only one enjoying it. So I think legacy is what you do while you're here that leaves an impact when you're gone. So for the listeners that are here, I love the Father John story that we talked about. That story is going to stay with me forever. How do we, as fathers, how do we be a good Father John in our homes? Being more intentional. Being more intentional. I think we as fathers, we we are given a burden that I won't say is unfair and I won't say is fair. But for many fathers in our society, we are viewed as the provider, the protector, and very rarely as the person who is responsible for the education part, right? Uh, we, we take these moments and as long as we make sure bills are paid, as long as we make sure the house is covered, we're looked at as a phenomenal dad. And I'm not saying you're not a phenomenal dad, but if you want to be intentional, take those moments and, and utilize them for growth experiences and educational experiences. Take times to enjoy the youth of your child. Um, another story that stuck with me is the story of the man with, uh, with a wife and a beautiful family. Every day the wife would come in as the children were babies and say, when are you gonna spend time with the babies? And he would always say, I gotta get this thing done so I can make sure their future is laid out. Well, he became wealthy and then the kids got older and they started saying, daddy, we want to go do this. We want to do this. And he say, I got to stay here so I can make sure you have something for tomorrow. Well, the wife got older, the kids got older and had their own family. The wife ends up dying. The only people that are left alone is the, is the kids. They have their own family. The dad calls the kids up and say, I want to spend some time with you. They say, Daddy, I can't because I got to build this legacy for my family. We've confused legacy building as only financial stability. Legacy building is making sure you spend the proper time. And the person you wanted, to, you wanted your father to be, the person you want to be, you, input, you, pour, the, you pour, pour that into your children. So I wanted my one of the things I just got through talking to a coach of mine about recently was I lacked confidence when I was younger. So what I poured into my children were confidence. They 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 are some of the most confident children you will ever meet. When they fail at something, they don't look at it as a failure. They look at it as a chance to learn something new. But that was because there was something I lacked. And I said, OK, well, if what type of man would I want to be? Well, that's what I'm going to pour into my boys. What type of man do I want my daughter to marry? I, I love the type of man that my wife has. She has a faithful husband. She has a loving husband. But there are some areas that I know I wanted to improve on 
that I'm now putting requirements in my daughter to see. And so now that's part of the legacy building, being intentional in what I do. So I think if, if you are a father out there and you're saying, listen, my family does not spend time together like I would like, be intentional about it. And then you don't have to be perfect with it. That's the one of the keys I think we as fathers mess up. We think we got to be perfect with it. We got to make it to every game. You only got to make it to a few games. They're going to remember the games you made it to way more than the games you made you didn't make. It. When you're yes. celebrating that win, they are going to say, my daddy was there. They're going to remember that time that you took them to the dance way more than the time you didn't show up on time for a, a, a certain event. Why? Because you were intentional and you could do what you could do. We are men. We got to make sure our families are provided for and taken care of. But there are these areas where we got a little time honed out and we got to say, OK, I can give that. But here's the key. And I wanted to put this in here. Make sure you take time to refuel yourself so you can be there for them. One of the reasons I think me as a dad, that was hard for me in the beginning of our, my fatherhood was because I thought as a father, it all went to them and to my wife. So guess what? I'm empty when I need and I don't have nothing to pour back out. A lot of fathers are pouring out everything and they don't put no time in refueling their self. That's the reason your podcast is so phenomenal. Hmm. This is the time that fathers need to take this in and say, OK, I'm going to get refueled for myself. I tell every dad, I'll tell you this. My wife used to, when I got home from work after working 12 hours, my, I used to work 12 hours, six days a week uh, at my barbershop. So I'm on my feet 12 hours a day, had a very successful barbershop. And so I would get home and she's looking at Superman, right? She's looking like, okay, he's home. I'm going to be able to take a break. Rightfully so. But I had to switch on hats. And one day I said, babe, I'm also Clark Kent. I said, and here's the deal. I need you to give me 30 minutes to an hour of just sitting here to do nothing. I said, because I've been talking to people all day. I said, and my mind is hasn't switched over. And I just need this 30 minutes to an hour. I know you've had it hectic. I said, but if you give me this 30 minutes to an hour, I promise you the rest of the night. And so what would happen is when she gave me that 30 minutes to an hour, she'd tell the kids, listen, leave daddy alone just for a couple of minutes. And then when I got that 30 minutes to an hour, I would jump up. That would be the time I'm eating. So, so here it is. I got to eat. I got to watch my show. Then I got up. It was playtime with the kids. I am listening. I'm, I'm talking to them. I'm reading them stories. She's able to relax on her own. Some nights we didn't do it. Some nights we were able to accomplish it. But here's mm -hmm. what happened. Because I took that small amount of time for myself, I was able to give so much value to others. And I think we as parents sometimes forget that. I agree. And I like how you said that it goes both ways for both parents. You both need that moment. So I, I really like that. That's great. I really appreciate your time and the, time, the fact that you're able to give your time to be here on. The Dad Space podcast is just great. So many practical things that dads can put into their life today from our conversation. Before we go, what would be your message to, to the audience? I'll tell you, like 75% of my listening audience for Dad Space are female, which I find interesting for a Dad Space podcast, whether they're coming to the podcast as a single mother or they're looking for ways to speak to their husband. But for those that are single parents listening to us, I'd like to give them a word of encouragement and some thought about how how to do this all by yourself with your family. Do you have any thoughts, Stephen, as we close off? Uh, can I give two words? Uh, first, I'd like to tell you you're doing a great job. If you are a single mother or a single father, I got to tell you, you are doing something that most of us cannot do. Don't let nobody judge you for having to work hard, having to grind like you grind. 
because you're doing it on your own. But here's the second thing. You don't have to do everything on your own. There are some resources outside. You have churches. You have these boys and girls clubs and these groups. Utilize the people around you. Uh, do your vetting, because I know we live in a day and time that you can't trust everybody. But when you find the people you can trust, allow them to support you. Because the truth of the matter is, I believe in the village mentality. Yeah. But I don't just believe in it for our kids. I believe in it for one another. We have to have a village to help support us. And sometimes it's hard to see how we can find that with such a hectic society, such a hectic world. But talk, talk to the folk in your village. That might be a single mother, but she does have a father, the, uh, 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 um, uh, the father of her children, but she's considered a single mother because the children are with her on the most part. Communicate your needs without talking about their flaws. Vice versa for the men. When you are dealing with people, communicate your needs on how you need to support, how you need the, how you need the support, and how you need the mental support so you can do your job well. And a lot of times you'll be shocked that most folk want to help. Those coaches, they want to help. They, those, those, those pastors. They want to help. Those, those parishioners around you, they want to help. The problem is we don't want to assume that you think you can't do it on your own. So know that you're doing a phenomenal job where you are, but you don't have to take the whole load on by yourself. And it was never meant to be that way. And I just want to give my hats off to every single one of them. I had to stay with my children uh, for a whole week at the house. Uh, well, shoot, during the pandemic, I had to stay with my kids. Oh, I told my wife, I said, listen, uh, <laughs> you already get whatever you want, but you need a raise. <laughs> I, I said, you need a raise because they just, they they had daddy. So they wanted all of that time that they could have. And I told her, I said, you need a raise. So I want to give a shout out to every single mother and single father because a single mom raising boys is a task. A single a father raising girls is mm -hmm. a task. Single parent by itself is a feat all of its own. And if you're raising a child to the best of your ability, pouring love back into them, trying to give them the best time they have and letting them know that you support them, you're doing far better than others. So I just want to give you a shout out with that. That's great, Stephen. And what I love talking about as well is whether it's a barbershop or a pulpit, or in the church or out in the community. Stephen, you're building community and I love the example of your family and I love the example of you and your wife. And I love the heart that you have to share and help and encourage others. Wherever they are, there's someone out there thinking of them. There's someone that cares for them, even if they feel like there's no one there in their life. There is somebody out there that really does care. And I'm hoping and praying that our conversation today just inspires somebody to reach out to their local church or community group and, and talk to somebody. And I'm, I'm hoping that if people were listening today to our episode, they realize there's good people out there with hearts that care for them. So like Stephen, for example, reach out and talk to these people and they can help you. So from the barbershop to the pulpit, I just love following along on your journey. And I, I love your podcast as well. It's, it's, it's amazing. So Stephen, thank you for putting yourself out there in the world and helping others. Thank you for being part of the podcast. Thank you for uh, putting up with all the technology problems halfway through our episode with the power going off. That was fun. That's what we do, right? That's what we, that's what happens. <laughs> Can you tell everybody how to contact you? Because I would love for people, A, to find your podcast. Or B, they have a question and they want to talk to you, Stephen, one-on-one. -on -one. If a listener wants to reach out, Stephen, to talk to you, how do they do that? So there's there's many ways to get in contact with me. I am on LinkedIn, uh, Stephen Garrett. 
Uh, I'm on uh, Instagram. I have two Instagrams, Stephen underscore K underscore Garrett Instagram, uh, and then the Pulpit View uh, as well on Instagram. Uh, I also am on uh, all of our social media on Facebook at Stephen Garrett. Uh, you'll see me uh, on YouTube under the Pulpit View or Stephen Garrett. I love helping people. Right now, I'm also taking on the responsibility of coaching pastors because I've noticed how many of our communities have lacked that, that work-life balance. And that's something passionate for me because it's hard for us to tell others how to care for your family. And we find ourselves with families that are in disarray. And so feel free to contact me. Uh, I would love to help if there's any way that I can reach out to you and help. And Dave, I got to tell you, thank you so much for allowing me to be on this podcast with you because this is my passion. I know it's your passion. And just since we met, uh, I think there's a brotherhood that has been developed uh, just from our conversations. I love people that hold us responsible for our roles of fa as fathers, but also encourage us to do the role well. So thank you for what you do as well. Awesome. And thank you for inspiring our community and, and being part of our podcast. Really inspired with you being here, Stephen. Thank you so yes, much. Sir. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Dad Space today. Go check us out on all of our social media, YouTube, all that great stuff. You can find us as Dad Space Podcast. Real simple. Dad Space Podcast, whether you're on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, even YouTube. Email us, dadspacepodcast at gmail.com. We're always looking for great guests to come on the podcast. If you have any feedback for us, let us know here at Dad Space. Looking forward to connecting with you on the next episode right here of Dad Space. Follow us on your podcast app for more. Cheers. To you, Dad. Thank you.